our show sponsors Real Ag Radio, Corteva and List E3, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. I am back in Ontario. The voice is back. Everything is good. And I am super excited about tonight's show. Uh, great to see so many people already hopping online. Uh, yes, we're on time. Woohoo! Um, and uh, hello to Ray. Yes, it snowed in some places out west. And uh, here in Ontario, uh, we did have a frost. For many of us, it was our first frost uh, this morning. So uh, there you go. Fall is uh, in full swing. And uh, hey, I could stick with some of this mild weather another month. That would be just fine with me. Uh, Kevin's here. I see Farmer Schneck and uh, Peter Johnson. I feel like I'm on Romper Room with which after that 80s music. Why not? Um, okay, <laughs> thanks, Producer Jay. I was not three minutes late, Peter. Okay, maybe a little bit. All right, uh, very quickly, um, today's show, uh, yes, we're going to talk spot spraying, we're going to talk uh, economics, green on green, green on brown, all that sort of good stuff. If you collect CU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. Let us know uh, you watch the show and, uh, and get those CU credits. Next week, just a quick uh, heads up, we're going to talk compaction. We're going to talk targets versus tracks. So uh, don't miss next week either. All right. Without further ado, let's bring in our dynamic duo for tonight. Yes, it is Mr. Aviators himself, Dr. Tom Wolf with Agrometrics and uh, one half of the Sprayers 101 team. How are you, Tom? I'm great, Lindsay. You? I'm doing well, thanks. And we've got with us from Saskatchewan, Carl Taconic smith uh, Carl, welcome here. It's your first go on the show. Yeah, excited. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, all right. Now, you, Carla, you mentioned uh, you farm in West, West Central Saskatchewan, I think that is? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what kind of crop mix have you got there? Uh, a lot of pulses, cereals, uh, canola, um, a little bit of flax once in a while. That's the main mix. Okay. I think flax at this point is a consequence. Um, okay, so t <laughs> I don't know if that's a choice anymore. It's a consequence. Uh, all right, so tonight... Let's break it down. Uh, we've got, so Carl, you've got some some in the field experience several years now under your belt with some of this technology. Of course, uh, for those, if you don't know Tom Wolf, um, you're watching the wrong show because everything about sprayers, we always go to uh, Tom Wolf. Let's start with just quickly, Tom, uh, when we talk green on green versus green on brown uh, spraying, what are we talking about? So green on brown is really the first iteration of spot spraying, and it means that uh, the sensor, be it a camera or some other kind of sensor, simply can tell if something is green or has chlorophyll versus the bare ground or, or trash or residue. So that was the first kind of spot spray that came on the market. It actually was in Saskatchewan in 1992 already and used NDVI, the thing that we use to sort of assess greenness of a crop nowadays. Uh, NDVI is still a... a, a one of the mechanisms of one of the spot spray systems, the one by Trimble, um, the Wheat Seeker does that. And uh, But there's a new one, and we're just, there's, this is the one that Carl uses, which detects chlorophyll. So it's not the color green, but the presence of a living plant material. So that's green on brown, good for pre-seed burn-off, fallow, that kind of a thing. And then green on green uses can use the same sensors if you do some thresholding work maybe carl will explain more about that in a moment but primarily uses cameras rgb video cameras and uses artificial intelligence algorithms to detect the shape of the target the color of the target other features the target might have and be able to determine whether that is a desirable or an undesirable plant crop or weed maybe even what kind of weed and then makes a decision to spray that weed. So you can use the green on green in crop, and you can sometimes use the green on brown in crop, but mostly it's uh, fallow. Yeah. So now, Carl, um, as as Tom alluded to, I, I believe you run the Weed It. Um, tell us a bit about sort of how you came around to choosing this particular piece of equipment. Yeah, so the biggest reason was um, I want to start using more water. Um, uh, on the plants uh, without using as much water volume in the tank, basically getting more more fill time, more seat time. Um, and also 
knowing that we need to get more actives per plant um, uh, at the same cost or less, basically. Also a big part of our operation is uh, chem follow. So seeing you know enough into the future that it's it basically it's uneconomical without systems like uh, green on brown uh, to effectively um, uh, do that anymore. A lot of our you know, uh, neighbors, uh, people in the Southwest have kind of quit chem falling because really without spot spraying, it's very, very difficult, if not almost impossible anymore. Mm -hmm. I had never even thought about the get more water, use more water without using more water. It's yeah, a brilliant, well, it, right? It kind of yeah. Kind of 10 gallons. I, I, I knew I wanted to spray at 10 gallons, but uh, trying to cover the acres that I do, I know I don't have time to spray at 10 gallons. So that, that was the sort of the compromise to, to start with. So now, Tom, um, we were just talking about, so Agritechnica, if I could speak tonight, is on next month. First time in four years. And we were talking, you were last week when we were in Saskatoon, you had said you were there four years ago, you saw some of this tech. Now you're going back to Agritechnica. What you saw there is in the field now. Mind blowing. That's right. Yeah, this has been, it's been four years, but I mean, what an exciting four years. Four years ago, we spoke to uh, Blue River and they had been purchased by John Deere already. And we just asked them, when are you coming to the field? They had no announcements. They were cagey. They weren't prepared to go public with any of their technology. Uh, we, I met with the fellows from Green Eye Technology at Agritechnica, and they were just really getting started. Both of those technologies are now for sale. Uh, Agrifac was there. Well, Blue River wasn't there in person, but they were represented by the Excel group of companies. So I saw the Agri, uh, the um, I guess the blue, the um, the Bilberry, sorry, the Bilberry system on a few systems, and they were just getting started in Australia, and now they're everywhere. So yeah, a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. Now the Agrifac system, that's another one that uh, is more common i guess we can say in canada not that any of these systems are common by any stretch um carl you have some experience with the agrifac or did you consider that one but went with the weeded system uh no i've, I've had a, a little bit of experience last year with the uh, blue river actually on the the john deere i did some comparisons with the new sea and spray system uh to the weeded so i i have had basically enough experience uh with that knowing from my my weeded experience um uh, and it's very very comparable from what i saw compared to what i run so carl you also brought up the point um you know multiple actives per plant that you're trying to hit more, more, so, more, more actives, yeah more, yeah more, more actives, actives right so yeah. more actives get them to the plant what yeah. what are your biggest hurdles in the weed spectrum what are your biggest issues uh kosha definitely number one uh lambs quarters um still wild oats is always there it's not too bad um on our operation but it's it's always in the back of your mind still um uh those are really the big really are the big three i would say still you know those are the ones you always have to be aware of mm-hmm when you're targeting kosha, are you, is there a certain time of year or are you looking for it and potentially targeting it multiple times a year? Uh, multiple, but definitely to the early side, uh, kosha being that early germinator, uh, definitely trying to target that as early as we can. Um, using some more residuals uh, than we have in the past. Uh, and, and chem follow has been a part of that. Uh, and with the weed, it, has allowed us to uh, to really control that population, but 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 it's very very targeted and time uh, sort of time consuming. It's um, it's a choice, I guess, that we made, and we've really targeted that weed specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not surprised you said kosher. I think we all probably could have guessed. I don't know that we talk about weeds at all in Western Canada without kosha coming up. So um, yeah, certainly, you know, not a surprise. Um, Tom, when you're looking at these systems and evaluating, you know, the spray pass and, and those sorts of things, specifically with kosha, with kosha, but some of these tough to kill weeds, how critical is it that we do 
the best job possible when we spray. Such an interesting evolution in that thinking, Lindsay, in the weed science community. When I started in weed science, you know, not that long ago, uh, we were always trying to get people to go to a thresholding and sort of say, look, I don't have enough weeds to justify spraying. The few weeds that are present are not causing much economic damage and we should really leave them and minimize the spray passes. Now that we have the pigweeds, the water hemp's and the, and the palmer amaranth, particularly in the US, but coming into Manitoba, and certainly now that we have the kochia, the thinking has changed. And, you know, I would say Ohio State probably put it best when they said, leave no pigweed behind. In other words, no thresholding for pigweeds. Every pigweed must be gone from that field because the price of allowing a resistant pigweed to survive and multiply in your field is too high. They may produce up to, you know, if you listen to Peter Sikkim, up to a million seeds on a water hemp per plant. I mean, if allowed to grow to a full height, of course. But we all know that it's uh, the seed bank will just become so predominantly resistant that it creates a future problem that we may not be able to put a, uh, you know, get a handle on. So that the, the, the critical part of this is that the, the spot spray systems are able to meet those criteria that we, uh, in fact, do spray every weed that is in the field and uh if we can't then that's a problem mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's a great point like I, I will go back uh you know to to a field and with this system uh, you know if it's a hundred weeds in a field i'll go back and 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 you can use it it's, it changes relationship from it's not really a chemical cost it's more of a time uh mm -hmm. basically I'm, I'm using my time instead of an expense essentially is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the problem that I see really with the industry is not a practice by any particular farmer, but you know, when we when we're recommending more expensive tank mixes, sort of the multiple effective mode of action philosophy that Carl alluded to, you know, we're kicking the problem down the road, right? We're buying ourselves time, but we're not really solving the problem because it is it's just really inevitable, judging by past history, that the weeds we're trying to control with these multiple effective modes of action will eventually also become resistant by some mechanism or other to the herbicides that we're, we're choosing to use on them. And, you know, so I think we can probably predict that at some point in the future, we're going to have to find another way of controlling those weeds. And the, the spot sprays allow us to buy that time by using the more expensive tank mixes and going after the, the few weeds that have survived and making sure they don't go to seed because it's cost effective to do a spot spray on that second pass. Mm -hmm. Really a great observation, Carl, for the, the shift from the chemical cost to the time cost, right? So, and time is maybe not always a cash cost, but there are only 24 hours in a day and there's only so many people. So what can you get done in a day? Um, it's a really cool point. I think that I yeah. think time is a cash cost because it's opportunity cost. Because the question yep. isn't how much does it cost you to be out there, but what could you be doing with that time that may be yeah. profitable? Yeah. And that you you have to think about that. So if you can spend yeah. a couple hours in the field going after your survivors as opposed to days, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. No, no, this, now, this might might, might be ahead. a little bit of a uh, for for another day, but th that's where I think autonomy and spot spraying. Um, are, are really going to fit hand in hand. Um, I know there's a few systems and we're, we're, you know, we're definitely looking into that because it is, it's really, it's an easy, it's an easy operation. It's just a time operation essentially is what it is. Mm -hmm. So Peter Johnson, I don't know, Carl, if you can see the comments, but Peter Johnson reads your mind, which I will, alert, I will alert you. It's a bit <laughs> terrifying, uh, but he says time. So will we go to swarms of autonomous sprayers here soon, like Australia? So this is, this is part of the mix, right? Is that we are rapidly, and and as we've alluded to, you know, four years ago versus now, the difference between, you know, on the showroom floor to in-field with several, you know, years under our belt of some of these, the idea of time and targeting these specific weeds, to me, those autonomous, you know, applications just become that other layer, another layer of what we could be doing. Yeah, but they're, also, and they're here. Yeah. They're they're here now. Yeah. We're we're actually going to go uh, southern Alberta on uh, this week. Uh, the swarm farm is actually in Alberta uh, now, so uh, hopefully this week we'll be to get to see that. Yeah, um, I just I'm also though I'm going to say that I generally don't like the word swarm. I would like to rebrand it as information 
or formation spraying, uh, but no one has caught on to this. So whatever. Um, I, I've apparently been, words don't matter that much. Okay, Peter's got some great questions, but you're just going to have to hang on for a second, Pete, because uh, we have a few things I want to do. But Carl, one of the things I just realized that we should do is back the truck up a little bit. Um, we have, of course, a large audience in Ontario. Um, chem fallow, not necessarily a term we use a lot here or something you see a lot of. Um, what is chem fallow? Why do you use it on your farm? Yeah, yeah. well, chem fallow is uh, where we, we don't crop anything. And I mean, the number one reason is, is moisture. So it's a storage of moisture. Um, uh, and and we, uh, we also use it for really as weed control. Like we, we are eliminating kochia in a lot of these fields, but it, it, it's using technology like this. It's very targeted. Um, it's a goal that we've set, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we're really striving hard for. Um, and there's, those are really the, the two reasons, uh, is, is moisture, uh, in the, it's really a, a Southern Saskatchewan, Southern Alberta, um, uh, practice basically. Mm -hmm. We have the opposite problem in Ontario. <laughs> we put in a whole bunch of tile to take the water away. Um, yeah, <laughs> so there you go. Okay, um, just quickly, actually, if we if we can, producer Jay, let's go to our first, uh, let's go to our first read, second read, I guess, of the night, and then we're going to come back and we are going to answer some of Peter Johnson's questions. Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Adama Canada, Real Ag Radio, and Enlist E3 from Corteva. Looking for high yields and clean fields? Choose Enlist E3 Soybeans, part of the Enlist Weed Control System. Enlist E3 Soybeans help you control tough weeds, providing herbicide choice and tank mix flexibility. Enlist E3 Soybeans, the best in beans, period. Sorry, there's just such good music tonight. Um, I'm surprised no one commented on our, our brand new, the our opening music. Anyway, thanks producer Jay. Okay, so Pete's got a great question about algorithms and I wanna go there and then I promise we're gonna talk economics because that's kind of the point. Um, but you did mention, Tom, so when we talk about the, the green on brown, it's either detecting you know, green or chlorophyll um, and, and differentiating that way. Um, and then, of course, then we look at uh, some of these units that are actually, as you mentioned, you know, they're they're determining perhaps leaf shape and some different parts of this. But that's machine learning. So how good are the algorithms? Amazingly good and getting better fast, uh, better than a human being by a long shot. So like even it's like kind a pure sycama? <laughs> I just, no, 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 yeah, no, no, we can. can't touch Peter Sigma. There's some there things that no, okay. no machine can do. But right. uh, I guess it's the speed, you know. I mean, the ability to identify a weed by species is uh, probably still a human skill that the machines are trying to get to. But the speed at which they can do it is really machine specific. We're literally, literally driving across the field at 15 miles per hour. And uh, it's able to scan, uh, you know, let's say a, a square meter ahead per camera, maybe a couple of square meters ahead per camera, depending on the spacing of the cameras, uh, finding plants, separating them from weeds, uh, separating weeds from crops, I guess, and uh, and then making a spray decision uh, based on a threshold that they that they've been asked to respond to. Uh, we're basically hitting most weeds at speed with. Uh, an algorithm that no one really understands, right? It may have a hundred million parameters. It's a huge mathematical equation. We don't know what's in it. Um, and actually the machines have decided what's in this. So <laughs> that's kind of the revolution, the convolutional neural network revolution. So yeah, it's truly Skylab uh, or Skynet, I should say, Skynet. <laughs> uh, I, we actually rewatched, you know, my wife and I rewatched uh, T1 uh, just last week, as I said, you know, there's so much happening here. Uh, now ChatGPT4. Yeah, say? we need to go back. Yeah, we need to go back yeah. and be like, what's what's to come? Yeah, there you go. Uh, Chat GPT four now uh, will uh, respond to uploads of pictures, and it will do weed identification on Chat Chat GPT four. It will identify crops from weeds. It will speculate on which weeds it is, they are, and it will speculate whether they might be resistant based on its algorithm. Uh, so this is not a trained uh, model on crops and weeds in Western Canada, but 
it's able to provide some decent answers. So it's things are moving fast. I mean, that's not enough to spray on. We still have to have a trained no. data set, but wow, uh, the algorithms yeah. are very good. Now, there are size threshold issues, and I think those are Western Canadian and, and even Eastern Canadian specific. We, we need to spray when the weeds are small here. Much yeah. of the testing for these algorithms has been done in row crops in the US and elsewhere, cotton, corn, and soybeans, where spraying might be a little later. And it might be, you know, the, the weeds might be a couple of inches across, which is easy peasy for AI. In early season spray rem weed removal, we need to spray weeds that are maybe half an inch across. And now that is going to be tough. And uh, we still don't have a good sense of how good these algorithms can be. They do have the option of doing a broadcast spray simultaneous to a spot spray. And I think maybe, maybe, maybe you have something to say about that, Carl. But that's very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't like uh, there are systems coming out that are dual tank that that's definitely going to be yeah. I mean, that's the next step on what I'm doing now, you know, to be able to target one a different plant or a different species independently of something else that that would be um, that opens up a whole nother box of, of what you okay. can things that you can do. Yeah. So Jason has a question here. Jason Vogt out of Southern Manitoba, not far from where you grew up there, Tom. Um, how advanced are these algorithms? So, and this is this is a great question. So if we're talking green on green, and we've got our issue of potentially, you know, small weeds, can it tell, can some of these tell between say wild mustard and canola or lamb's quarters versus quinoa? Like some of these very similar ones, how good is it so far do we know yet? The so they do have to be trained for the situation that they have they want to be deployed in so for example when bilberry visited manitoba and looked at the first agrifac equipped with her system that was uh, sold near dominion city um they basically said we're going to be taking pictures while you spray and we're going to try to learn from those pictures what the crops okay. and weeds okay. look like and we're going to refine our algorithm so we can have a deployable algorithm say uh, that, that does broadleaf weeds, Manitoba broadleaf weeds in Manitoba cereal crops. Or perhaps they might go to Saskatchewan and do the same thing and try to find an algorithm for uh, weeds and lentils. So those are specific cases and they do have to find, you know, they have to take pictures and basically train the picture, uh, train the algorithm on the picture. And it also takes a lot of human beings, believe it or not. It's not just feeding pictures to a machine. There's actually a human being involved that actually traces the outline of each plant in that picture and says, this is where this plant ends. This is where the leaf, this is what the leaf shape is. And, uh, and that's called annotating and it takes time. So there's people behind computer screens just basically drawing outlines around weeds in a picture and saying, that's pigweed. That's wheat. Wow. Yeah, Tom, uh, yeah. Tom's right. It's, I mean, that's where it's going. It's just, the, the, you know, the, the algorithms that, that they have now are, are, or really aren't there for everything now. The, I think the two first that Bilberry came out with is the broadleafs in cereals and um, uh, grasses in canola, of course, which are, you know, the, the two simplest. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other side of that, though, that's also your cheapest pass. For a, right. uh, for, for a broadcast pass. So you're not really solving necessarily yet the, the hardest of our, our most yeah. difficult, expensive problems yet. So, and, and I'm glad you mentioned this, Carl, and, and let's start down this path. So Kevin, who's out in BC, uh, Kevin says, how do you know how much volume to mix when you don't know how many liters per acre you're actually going to use? This is a great question. I love that we're getting into like the the tactical stuff here. So Carl, when you, how do you decide? How much do you make? It, well, the, the, I, this, it's definitely the most answer, asked question <laughs> on spot spray. The, the easy answer is it doesn't matter. Usually if you, you, a system like this, you've probably got plenty enough acres that, to spray it on. So it doesn't really matter when it runs out. The, the long answer honestly is just experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Once you, you can get to look out at a field once you do a handful of fields and you can say oh, that field's probably going to take, you know, two gallons an acre or, or three gallons an acre, uh, as the, the whole volume, you're still putting that 10 gallons per plant, but, but you're, uh, uh, you know, the gross volume, you, you can, you can guess that very close after, after a little bit of experience. Okay. I like it. 
Yeah, I would imagine that, Carl, you probably don't fill the tank to the brim when you go out there. You basically get a sense of how much you're using per acre. And then in your second fill, you can probably be quite accurate based on the previous tank's uh, usage pattern, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's sort of weird. Like, uh, you'll get scared a lot of times when you first start to spot spray because you're outside round or, or two. Will, yeah. will um, quite often can use up sixty five percent or or fifty percent of yeah. your of your tank, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, I'm, I'm going to run out, and, and now you can do the the, the last hundred and twenty acres with what's left with fifty percent of your volume. Yeah. It takes a little bit get to get used to that used to that, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it it really is experience. It is no you know there's not one field the same, um, uh, but it doesn't take very long to uh, to, to judge sort that. It out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Now, uh, Peter wants to know, and this is for you, Tom, uh, if if we're using green on green, what do we know about using higher rates without cross causing crop phytotoxicity? So this is one of those questions of, can we go higher rates? Does it protect us from? That would be off-label, Peter, if you go too high. I'm just going to put that out there. It's a it's a great question because uh, the Australians have in fact pursued that as a uh, a label amendment where they recognize there's some very tough to control weeds that may require higher rates that are higher than label, and they've permitted those on the on the with the thinking that per acre you're still below label, but per right. spot you're temporarily above label. Now that's green on brown that's in summer right. fallow or i guess summer spraying as as the australians would call it, not technically summer fallow in the sense that we use um but uh that is a possibility now in terms of crop uh phytotoxicity for green on green that's a question that we do have and uh okay. right now we do know that pmra uh has asked the registrants for data on 2x of the label rate and that's for overlaps so that we are crop safe on overlaps so we can probably safely go there but again it is uh so all the all the registrants data is is it has to be provided for up to 2x right. because there are some parts of the field that do get that so we can right. probably go that far but um you know it's not i mean we do should should probably do it in the in a in the context of of a label amendment that is pursued by the registrants mm -hmm. there are some very good questions and mr sean Schill is asking one here but we're going to get to that one in a bit because it sort of works into Carl, um, we do want to talk about the economics of this. And what's what's interesting to me, and and Tom, I know you've got some some napkin math, but also it was more sophisticated than that, everybody. Uh, where we where you actually did work out, you know, is this really about saving money, or is this really another tool in weed control and in potentially doing a better job, or as you said, extending the products that we have? So, Carl, for you. Is this purely economic? It does it pay for itself slam dunk in two, three years? Or what does that economic sort of picture look like for you? Yeah, for us, it, it, it is economic. Um, the, the payback on the weeded system is about three years uh, on our operation. So um, a little bit of that, like from 20 on, in 2022, um, on say 10,000 10, seeded acres uh, with a, with 2,000 acres of chem follow on top of that. Um, just the crop savings alone, so that's uh, would be burn off and fall spray, uh, was in that 80 to $90,000 range. And then on top of that with, with chem fallow, um, another 55,000 just, just on that, uh, you know that that's the math of that is just is based on the difference in actives that I'm you know, if I was to put the same active per plant on a broadcast versus what I'm putting on with the spray yeah. that that's where that math is is coming from the difference in that yeah. right and that's a key point right is that not all actives or products are created equal and don't all cost the same so the math definitely is going to change whether or not you know a a cheapy cheapy mix is going to work or if you really need some of those higher end more sophisticated products because of either your crops that you're growing or the weeds that you're targeting and of course you've got pulses in the mix so we know that they are ah, about everything um so there you go that's a technical term everybody is um, <laughs> just write write that down there yeah anyway um 
so Tom, I mean, the logically we think, okay, if we can use less active, um, if we can cover more acres, like these are all economic factors, yes. But there is a cost to the equipment. S uh, some of these have subscriptions that you would pay per acre. Is it always a slam dunk of it's it's going to save you money on every field? You know, it. I guess uh, there are probably a few tiers to that, Lindsay. I would say, uh, at the, in the initially, when someone considers spot sprays, they're obviously thinking about the savings and the payback and the ROI, and that's the first tier. And I think the the savings are definitely there, and uh, you know, it depends a little bit on the size of the farm, of course, but. Um, there's other tiers and you know the tier might be you know you know if you're doing green on green is there a subscription fee and some of the subscription fees are now out and they're about three to four dollars per acre for the use of an algorithm so then if for example you're using a product maybe it's a generic product uh, you know that's relatively cheap um, if it costs four or five dollars per acre uh, is it worth spot spraying it at all or is it is broadcast better because then you have no risk of a miss, for example, and needing to respray. Okay. You know, if you were to go say, I, I want to save, like, uh, you know, you, you, you spend, let's say you have a $10, a $10 per acre treatment, you have a $3 algorithm cost, and you obviously uh, have a potential to save even if you even after paying the $3 algorithm cost. But you still have another potential cost there that you may need to consider, and that is what is the cost of a miss? You know, what is the yield cost of a miss? What is the resistance development cost of a miss? What is the need to respray cost of a miss? And those costs also have to be kind of added in and considered in, in somewhat higher, higher tier levels. Uh, look, time. Carl mentioned the importance of time already. That's a really a currency. Do we actually have the time to respray that field? Like, it might take seven to ten days for that symptom to appear to know whether you've actually right. missed those weeds and for them to now be differentiated from you know the the the, the surviving weeds be differentiated from the dead weeds um do you have that time is it too late as a yield loss occurred or can you still get in the field at that time uh, are you busy doing other things uh, so yeah there are some costs that we we do have to consider another level that i'd, I'd like to pose though is is what do we do with the savings you know, uh, do we put that in our pocket, pay for the equipment, or is that an investment in our in our land, in our future? Do we invest those savings in studying alternatives to herbicides? Do we invest those savings in more expensive tank mixes that prolong the utility of the herbicide system that we're currently employing? Uh, let's think about those terms as well. I don't think we should just put the money in the bank. I think we ought to maybe reinvest it into our systems. Mm -hmm. Carl, is that your plan or are you going to Cabo with your savings? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, like I, I see it, it's it's savings, but really the, the equipment is, is really allowing us to do um, uh, really to, to do things that we couldn't have done before. Uh, it, you know, I mean, this is chem fallow. Um, it falls, fall spraying. I mean, in 2022, when the price of Roundup went up, if you've only got Canada thistle in the fall, how do you afford to to put three liters per acre on if it's when it's just Canada thistle there? So it, it, essentially, we're one, of, we're one of the only ones out in the field because you you can't broadcast that at fifteen dollars a liter, right? Right. So it 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 allows you to to do things that, that others can't do anymore is, is really what it uh, comes down to. And so uh, it back to the sort of that green on green. Um, like when I'm talking to people or everyone wants to focus on that green on green. Um, but but I, I, I really believe that uh, I mean, most of our resistant issues and a lot of the problems that we can solve today are really solved by the green on brown. It's it's really that that burn off the fall spray. Um, I mean, the question you know becomes is you know on that green on green in crop is that eighty five percent accuracy sufficient? I don't really think it is because that's our last pass. That that's you know that's our last opportunity. Um, you know, if we miss a handful of weeds in the in the burn off, well, that's the, we're we're going to get that with that last full pass in crop that's our last chance and, and as tom alluded to on 
the time. Like it, mostly we only have time for one pass anyways at that critical, you know, in, in crop spray time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. P.S. Uh, there's someone named Erica in the chat and she votes for Cabo. She <laughs> says I, it might be your wife. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, OK, so this does, though, this brings in Sean Schill's question. So, and in thinking about that, Tom, and thinking about, you know, where you may uh, reinvest or Carl, as you said, with the outside rounds, maybe making a little nervous on spot spraying. So Sean asks, what about using a system like SWAT camps that identifies weeds in zones and treating zones for that specific weed pressure? What do you think of that, Tom? I love the SWAT cam approach. I really do uh, because it, uh, you know, they, they've placed it in, in, a, in a way you learn a lot about your field. Obviously, you've got a, a, a plant density count. You've got a weed uh, emergence uh, count as well. You you can associate where if the weeds are associated with a certain of the 10 zones in the SWAT cam system or the SWAT map system. Um, it's much more likely, it's much more easy to just deploy your existing sectional control and spot spray zones differently, perhaps with different rates. If you have a, a product that might be organic matter or soil texture rate specific, or some of them are, or weed type, uh, certainly Liberty has a lot of different rates for different weed species. And so you might be able to deploy different rates of Liberty based on those zones and, and get some savings out of that. I mean, that's that's a very cool idea. It could be a, you know, a bit of an introduction to the spot spray concept and whether it's it's good for you and then maybe ramp it up a little later with some more sophisticated technology later. But I would say for a system developed in Nakem, Saskatchewan, uh, it's pretty hot. Yep, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's, a great, uh, it's like a great yeah. tool for um, uh, knowing, like putting residuals down, those expensive residuals, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. spot spraying kind of think of more as the real time variable rate. You know, it's, it's, you don't have to, pre, you're not pre mapping anything. You're actually killing the weeds where they are in real time. Yeah. So that's really kind of the difference, I think, is one is planning, one is in real time. Yeah. And I, th I think, Carl, I think that's a huge difference. Uh, it's a very important difference. I'm glad you brought it up because the extra step of, you know, getting data and then creating a prescription map putting that map into your rate controller and then implementing that map, however you do, those steps are significant. And that's one of the reasons that the drone maps for spot spraying really haven't taken off yet. Uh, we need a high density of a drone imagery to get the pixel resolution down to see the individual weeds. And then we have to stitch them together and process them and run them through algorithms and then develop a map. A spot spray map has to be RTK and then spot spray that. Uh, those are three or four steps that not everybody's prepared to take. It involves probably a third party that can do that for you. That'll that'll be another uh, cost incurrence. So, it, you know, we're just watching that space very closely because it does have certain advantages to know where your weeds are and which parts you have to spray. Maybe you can implement a different path system. You don't have to just go up and down. You Maybe you'll be able to be more targeted in where you drive in the field um, mm -hmm. and be certainly more accurate with how much to put in the tank. But we haven't seen that. And that's because the just the convenience of having a an instantaneous decision mm -hmm. is so, so important. I, I could see certainly where, you know, in a case where you have something like you've got a wild oat patch or you know you have patches you need to manage and those sorts of things like the the level like a SWAT cam map or whatever i mean that does already get you sort of halfway there but it's a really good point that it is more it's there's a time lag right there's planning and there's all those sorts of things that'll go into it um that you know a, something like the weeded or, or something else might be able to just you're already rolling and away you go so we do get we do get retroactive maps from all of these systems and that basically means you know where did i spray therefore right. yeah. where were the weeds and carl you're using an as applied map on your john deere is that correct for that uh that's kind of quote quasi weed map is that right yeah yeah basically just going by water so if they're if, if your water volume goes up 15 gallons an acre you know there's lots of weeds there if it's running at one probably not very many weeds there but I, I don't really okay. use the map. Like I say, it's, you know, that's why I have used spot spray because it's, it's really the real time, you know, it's, uh, yeah. that's really what it's for. 
But but you could you do at least have some data of essentially that is that yeah. as applied that you could go back to potentially yeah. um, yeah. see yeah. right like yeah your progress on some of these things now um, Peter's got a couple things he wants to talk about and he did follow up and I think this is important because Tom you and I talked about this and Carl I'd love your thoughts on this as well because one of the key parts of this is that we're using products more precisely right so we can potentially pay those extra dollars maybe maybe we have to because perhaps we don't have a lot of other choices so we've got to use that higher value product so what pete was sort of asking for or asking about when he talked about that you know two times or h or whatever is you know thinking about in situations where crop injury is a concern so we certainly have products definitely in the pulse world edible beans those sorts of things that don't don't love the past that goes over them and it does sort of you know hits hits them a little harder um carl for the the crops that you're using you're using um you know burn down and after so is that something that you would want to do is to potentially be able to use this in crop and and not worry so much about uh crop injury yes yeah well sort of i guess the the biggest thing what i see is is with a dual tank if if i could um specifically select a, a one type of plant like if i could you know use a, the background rate on say lentils and then if i could use that spot spray tank for something very specific to say kosher now that's also going to be how thick is the kosher you know if it is just a, a few then it doesn't then that spot spray isn't going to matter you, you know it's just going to be a few spots if if it's very thick if that's going to cause injury i think then that's going to be a problem so it's all it's going to be totally related to the density of of the those really problem weeds which is what was kind of alluded to in australia where it's you know it's just a few hard to kill weeds dispersed well that that's pretty easy to solve mm -hmm. yeah and you know there was some work done by the university of nebraska uh, they were doing spot sprays on corn, and they were using a herbicide that uh, whose name I'm not familiar with, but it's uh, it causes some damage on corn. And they realized that in the spot sprayed fields, they actually had much higher yields in the corn because of less phytotoxicity. So that's kind of a, a side benefit to having a spot spray in a green on green environment. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's also a question here, and I think we should clarify this, but this dovetails into that conversation, Tom, about what do you do with your savings? Where do you reinvest it? Um, because it, it comes back to, I think, what do you do when weeds don't die? So Pete says, so what's a miss? Is a miss where the sprayer didn't go and, and spray did not reach and you've got a strip? Or is a miss weeds that didn't die? Because to me, you treat those two things very differently. So what do you consider a miss? Is a miss where weeds don't die or where the past didn't actually happen? Uh, in the context of spot sprays, I've been defining a miss as a weed that is present that was not sprayed uh, or, uh, you know, it just simply wasn't detected. I, I don't think it's fair to say a miss is a weed that didn't die because some herbicides aren't that good on some weeds and they may not have died on a broadcast spray either for reasons related to their size or their species or the rate that was used. But I'm concerned about a weed that's clearly present that cannot be detected and therefore is missed. And there's lots of lots of situations for that in, in crop, right? It could be under another plant shadowed. It could be under residue. Who knows? It could have been driven on and misshapen because of the wheel and and therefore as unrecognizable to the to the algorithm. Lots of reasons for those misses and they do occur. That's why you know, the dual tank systems, at least in the U.S., where there's a lot more availability of, of pre-emergent or residual herbicides in their major crops. We have less availability of that in the small grains and oil seeds, but certainly in the row crops we do, uh, is really valuable. Having a dual tank system can put the broadcast down that will possibly take care of potential misses and be a backup okay. system for you. And that's really what's happening in, in the US systems. I mean, they're really recommending that we do a residual pass on all of our fields for those instances. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe we have yeah. to get used to that in Western Canada as well. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really, it's, it comes down to understanding this, the system. So you know, whatever system you purchase, um, it's it's really knowing what it can do and what it can't do and then that will define um uh, basically 
is your number one rule that that I've that I've always tell people when they're asking about spot spraying is it's not for every field. If you know if you're going to buy a spot spray, just and, and and go spot spray every field on your farm, you'll be very disappointed. It, it, it you have to define what it's good at and what it's not. Um, and how, how I've defined that uh, is like I sort of call it the one third, one third, one third. So early in the season, um, I'll use a lot more straight spot spray because it, it's just probably winter annuals, a lot easier to see weeds. So I'll, I'll, I'll employ more that straight spot spray. Once you start to get some of the small, newly emerging weeds, I'll, I'll shift to a dual rate. So I'll have that background rate there um, for those weeds that I know that it may not be able to see. The last third, you've probably had a rain or two, the field is fairly green. You've probably moved to a full spot spray, or sorry, a full coverage uh, okay. spray. You're not, you're not even using the technology. So that's how I usually explain to people if, if they're looking at their operation, uh, how they can guess at what their potential savings may be is, is sort of using those three. That, that generally is how most seasons go is that that's the progression. Okay. What would you say, Carl, then? So in a, if, you know, pre-seed burnoff is the most use it's going to get, what would you say for misses? Like how accurate is it? Because certainly as Tom explained, I, I can certainly think of instances exactly that residue cover, those sorts of things where even if, you know, you rolled over it, it didn't see it or didn't whatever. How do you, are you happy with the accuracy, I guess? I, I, I think accuracy is, yeah, in that 95 to 98 percent. Um, I've, I've done lots and thousands of acres of side by side and, it's a lot most times it's hard to tell um it's really it's understanding what, what they're not good at a, a lot of these systems uh for a couple of examples um so a newly emerged wild oat so when you think of that you, you look down at that it looks you're looking at the head of a pin well that you know that's those are hard to see so if if that is what you're after they're hard to kill anyways at that point but if you are after that that's when a dual rate would need to be employed um mm -hmm. Uh, I think another big one too that I think that gets people hung up a little bit is I, I believe that our resistance is not from that one single weed that we may or may not have missed in the middle of the field. It's from say a patch of kosher on the edge of the field where there's a hundred thousand plants and, and we're all trying to put an average rate, an affordable rate across the whole field. Well, maybe we only kill 900 thousand out of the millions seeds that are there so now now we have a hundred thousand potential resistant plants there whereas that one little missed plant in the middle of the field one of two things usually either happens to it it either the drill usually kills that one single plant or it buries it but it's those big patches and that's where spot spray um, is very very effective in any kind of a plant that grows in a patch because it, it essentially it doubles the rate um, within those patches. Um. So, so many things. And I know, and <laughs> we know that Tom, we only have until nine, so we got to rock and roll later. So, uh, Producer Dave, if you could, let's have our last read of the night, and then uh, there's a few points on this resistance management thing I want to tackle yet. Our sponsors are Adama Canada, Enlist D3 from Corteva, and Real Ag Radio. Real Agriculture's Real Ag Radio is Canada's only daily one-hour agricultural radio show broadcast across North America on Rural Radio Channel 147, Sirius XM. Hosted by ag expert Sean Haney, the show airs weekdays at 4.30 Eastern across Canada and the U.S. and is rebroadcast at 7 a.m. the next day. Listen live on Rural Radio 147 or check it out on realagriculture.com slash radio or download as a podcast. The Tuesday host is pretty cool too. Uh, that's this girl. Okay. Um, so this is, it is fascinating. And as Pete points out, this technology would be amazing for our cleanup pass and corn and soybeans, weeds here, there. Now, and that's the other thing. I mean, we're talking for row crops, exactly that. And I know a lot of this technology has been used in row crops. You've got a lot of room for quite some time that 
you could be targeting weeds. So I totally get it, Pete. So get one and start using it. And um, there you go. And also, Peter wants to know why I'm not running videos. You know what, Peter? Um, thank you for that. Uh, yes, I still run videos, but um, I went through, I picked two. All of them are kind of dated already. I'll be honest um, in that this is this technology is moving so quickly. And then the most relevant one I think we had was with Carl. So I think that it was just better to have Carl on. But thanks, Pete. I'll have next time you're on, I'll be sure to have extra ones to make up for it. Uh, so there you go. But it is it's it's technology that's moving really quickly, um, which is great because we can use it. So here's where I want to sort of end on tonight. And, and it is this concept of Yes, this technology paying for itself, but obviously having a payoff as well, um, and then reinvesting potentially that that dollar in our management. So, so Carl, I, I'll start with you. Why? What was the sort of the impetus to go forward when you saw this? When you saw the weeded or you saw this technology, what was like? Yes, that's what I need. I could do basically it's I can do something now that no one else can do uh, we're honestly we're one of the last one of the few left in southern Saskatchewan that can actually chem follow anymore there's lots that maybe don't but there's lots that would if if they could and uh and that really is the it's it's what's separating us a little bit from so it's just it's just technology and it's just you know, applying that technology um it is allowing us to reduce our kosher populations um so there's you know those are really the big the big reasons of, of why we're doing what we do mm -hmm. tom if if you could put together your wish list of how you would like to see farmers reinvesting those dollars spent what does that management plan look like I have, I have three answers to this. I mean, in the short term, they're going to have to reinvest in multiple effective mode of action tank mixes so that they can buy themselves some time. The second is that I would like to see uh, pre preparing themselves for the, I hate to say inevitable, but probably inevitable time when they'll have fields that they can't deal with a persistent weed with in a chemical way at all. Uh, because of resistance and I'm not sure when that day will come but it's certainly here for some farmers in North America and Australia and they've had to resort to cultural methods and I'd like to just open the, uh, the open people's awareness of that eventuality and prepare themselves for it with equipment and 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 studying other cultural practices and thirdly I just want to maybe go back to the utility of the weed map and what what a powerful agronomic tool that might be if you have an if you know where the weeds are and what patches look like and what species are in patches it gives you so much power as an agronomist or someone evaluating success of a weed management system for example as a fellow named greg stewart he's got a system out that identifies patches of weeds based on based on weed maps and looks at the shapes of those patches and might be able to say look i think those patch the, the shape of that patch indicates to me that that patch may originate in some some certain way might be a resistant origin and maybe we can have early intervention there we wouldn't have recognized that without the analysis of the path shape or otherwise you might be able to go into that field and say look i've got weed patches here of this species and some soil applied products are particularly useful against those weed species they don't have to be present i'm going to spot spray pre-emerges without weeds being present to preempt the problem before they emerge and that can be that can also be targeted but only facilitated by a good accurate weed map so those are really powerful reasons for me to uh, to invest in in the technology uh, future ready and make better use of your existing chemistries. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really great questions that have trickled in here, it's sort of around this thought as well. Um, Sean Chill is looking for a way to not have to walk his fields and pick out those pesky wild oats that hover above his weak canopy. Uh, can can the system and algorithms pick a wild oat out from a cereal crop? Tom, have you seen it? Because that sounds like it'd be rather difficult. Yeah, I haven't seen it. And I think it would be the holy grail, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> there has been some good successes, though. There have been some successes. You know, like in Australia, they have picked out a weed called wild radish 
uh, that looks exactly like canola or it looks like basically the wild mustard in canola problem and they've done it successfully yeah. in canola so getting pretty close uh, but you know even in a seasoned agronomist is going to have a hard time looking at a field and picking out the wild oats if they don't grow between the rows yes yeah no you just wait till the panicles above the wheat crop it's easy. yes you and then you spray mad then you spray mad of it right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He, Sean's got lots of kids. He can send them out there. Uh, I think they're too old for that now. They're too bored. All right. Uh, Jason's also got a question. Okay. So this is a good one. So Carl, um, mm -hmm. if you've got a weed patch, uh, let's say, is it better? Are we thinking higher rates in those patches or are we looking at modes of action for those, like multiple modes of action? So how do you approach, let's say you got a kosher patch, what's mm -hmm. going to be your go-to? Oh, it's a little bit of both it's you know it's higher rate with with higher higher water volume um and, and that that that's the sort of the, the the genius of these spot spray systems is um they they are your 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 actual rate and set rates are slightly different so uh if you've got it set for 10 gallons per acre well that 10 gallons per acre is what you're getting on a single weed what happens is when a bank or, or a sec two two or three nozzles come on together, um, you get that doubling of, of rate um, within within that patch. So that that's that's why they're so effective on any grasses or or uh, uh, canna thistle patches, kosher patches. Uh, you, you get that doubling of rate effect with with a spots when you're working with just straight spot spray. So yeah, it's a higher higher rate, uh, just a killing a killing rate. I don't know if you've got that picture. There's there's two pictures there that I'd sent in of the of a field. Uh, I'm not sure if you can bring those up. There's the the one with the. It's on a field edge. Uh, if we go to the other one with the weeds on the left first, that was after. So this is before. So our chem follow on the right. Um, uh, uh, another chem follow on the left that I was called in to, to fix up. So that was full sprayed on the left. That was two times wow. just spot spray on the right. So you can see the effectiveness wow. of spot spray. Um, and that's just resistant kosher essentially on the left. Now I went in with just straight spot spray. If you bring up the next picture it's from the same spot, that's straight spot spray. That isn't, that's not a, there, there was on a full half section, I couldn't find a weed that, and, and we didn't have to spray that again. So it's just, it's, it's incredibly effective at, uh, wow. uh, at doing what it does. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's, it, they're the real deal, the system. So I'll also note, it looks like there's a bit of a roll there, everybody. So, and this is the sketch. So there you go. It's not all <laughs> not flat. flat no. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, yeah. So that's, that is remarkable. Um, and very satisfying, I have to tell you, uh, for kosher, because, you know, there's other weeds that maybe, eh, whatevs. But for kosher, it's a, it's a bad one. Um, right. And uh, Pete seems to think we're going to figure out the wild oat problem. Need to find out what the difference is. And then they'll find something and t technology will get there. I love this, Pete. Um, okay. He's he's on our side. We're going to get this to work. So there you go. Um, all right. Now, okay. We do have to wrap up uh tom's got somewhere to be uh carl's got to plan a trip to cabo and uh, i gotta go to bed so there you go uh so thank you tom i know you're on the road so thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me it was great yes and carl thanks so much for sharing your experience and and all that you're doing out there it's super cool stuff i really appreciate it yeah thanks a lot I enjoyed it all right. Okay. And thank you to everyone in the comments as well. Great group. Some fantastic questions. Um, if you want to uh, share this, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. We always have uh, the episodes up there. You can go back and rewatch or share them. Um, it's also on YouTube, of course. So check it out there, which is where most of you join us from. Uh, this was absolutely super cool. And we'll be doing something like this again. If you've got any questions, uh, follow up uh, for either of our guests, please just let me know. And yeah, just a quick reminder next week we are going to talk uh tires and tracks and we're going to talk compaction next week so check it out 8 p.m eastern thank you of course to our show sponsors and to our guests have a great night cheers everybody <laughs>